Yeah. Anything else? Have you ever uh, uh, dealt with the University of Iowa on the research they've done, which showed the use of NP and K at 60% with, uh, utilized by the federal, state, county, and city governments and breaking down to rural America agricultural farmers, be whatever type, at 38%? Hmm. No, I'm not aware of that. As University of Iowa or Iowa State? At Ames, Iowa State. Uh huh. Because I, I thought first you were going to talk about University of Iowa Medical School, which has looked at the health of farmers a lot and, and finding. Well, we got our, uh, Agent Orange dioxin. Uh huh. You know what Agent Orange is? Yeah, uh huh. A pretty simple 1 1 formula. Uh huh. And uh, it was surprising that uh, DuPont and Monsanto quit making dioxin for 20 to 22 years and then started making it again two years ago. Mm -hmm. That's one of the most cancer-causing hmm. materials out there. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I admit I haven't followed that. I'm not aware. Okay. On uh, mineral, minerals that are mined, uh, anything on your micro and macro nutrients? Yeah, uh, micronutrients are allowed. So uh, there's certain forms that are prohibited. Here, I, I always uh, look up in the regulation. <laughs> Whoops. Oh well, we're done with that. <laughs> End of show. <laughs> Click to exit. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, micronutrients are allowed, but I, 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 I like to be precise. Uh, uh, okay. Because there are certain forms that are allowed, and you have to uh, have a soil test first. Um, to show that you actually have a deficiency. Yeah, micronutrients. Um, those made from nitrates or chlorides are not allowed. So a sulfate form like zinc sulfate, something like that would be allowed, but soil deficiency must be documented by testing. So if you're gonna do micronutrient balancing, that's allowed, but part of your organic plan, you'd have to show that you have a deficiency um, and then you're addressing it with putting in the micronutrients and then they uh, can't be a nitrate or chloride form. So that's the kind of details you get into with this. And that's why I don't, I always like to look things up rather than memorize them because. I, I like but, to go to San Francisco and ask questions, you know, ionic uptake, uh, root hairs, can you explain photosynthesis? They can. Uh -huh. It's amusing if you have a background in major soil science crop production. Uh huh. 73 U of M. Uh huh. No. Agitating when you didn't have the opportunity. Uh huh. Yeah, well, luckily they. Uh, Telling the truth. Uh huh. Well, in Minnesota, um, we got three different places of the university that's got organic land now. We got that 120 acres at Lamberton and 13 at Wasika. And then there's a student organic farm on the St. Paul campus. And I think there, soon there's going to be some more organic specialists added to the faculty. We got some appropriations from the legislature. So, you know, I, I, I see that. Uh, we were a leader, we kind of uh, are still seen as a leader nationwide in organic research, but I think now we're gonna take some steps to invest in it to really step it up a notch and, and be, truly be uh, a, one of the you know, leaders in the country on that. But at the same time, you know, we do have major investment in biotechnology, and Cargill Center and all that going on. So. Is uh, uh, Giles Randall still? Yeah, mm -hmm. Wasika? at Wasika, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, and he, you know, shook things up by basically saying that this corn and beans system is not sustainable. You know, he had documentation and you know linking it to the dead zone, and these practices just can't be done forever, especially in the you know the karst region. 
uh, with shallow topsoil and fractured limestone. I had the opportunity to be on the advisory board for the extension service up there, so uh -huh. that's not only how I initially got to meet them, but to uh, follow on going what they're doing organically, yet, even though it's, as you mentioned, 13 acres. Yeah, so. yeah, and, and right now, yeah, it, it, it's kind of, it could, there, there's a lot of potential that uh, can be maximized with that Waseca land that's not being maximized right now, but I think, I think it's just a matter of time and it will be, but luckily it's been kept organic and there's been some faculty doing research there, but there's not really a lead person at the Waseca station. They don't have a position, uh, you know, an organic specific researcher there. But we're just launching very exciting uh, uh, field of research out at Lamberton um, this coming year. Well, we've already started last fall by planting cover crops, uh, rye and vetch. And then uh, um, there's a whole new system of no-till organic production where uh, you, on the front of the tractor, mount this roller, which is a big cylinder that has these bars that come out at a chevron pattern. And uh, when the rye is heading out or the uh, vetch is about 75% in bloom, you come in with this on the front of the tractor, it rolls it down and crimps the stem every seven inches, so you're breaking the vascular system. You don't till it at all. You, and on the back of that same tractor, you've got a no-till planter. So you can plant corn or beans or any number of other crops. So it's one pass, you roll down the cover crop and plant, and the next pass is harvest. So no cultivation, no rotary hoeing, no flame weeding, and uh, you're building soil organic matter. You're protecting it all winter from erosion, and you're preventing uh, uh, erosion during the summer, too, because there's that mulch mat. So you're preventing weeds, and you're feeding those soil organisms. You're helping prevent uh, evaporation. And uh, Rodale has been working with this for nine years now, and they're getting excellent yields uh, with this system. And so uh, we put in quite a few different plots of cover crops, and we bought a roller crimper and uh, no-till planter, and we're, our field day is going to be July 10th out at Lamberton, the organic field day, and we'll be demonstrating this no-till organic uh, roller uh, at that. So. I imagine, are you doing a baseline in kind of the organic matter and the health of that system? Yeah. Again, because I'd imagine you'd have to have a pretty healthy system to fight kind of a weed base. Uh, or, or are you looking at that as a first pass for a farmer transition? Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's so new, and there hasn't been that much university replicating what Rodale's done, and right now we're... In, in a collaborative project with Iowa State, North Dakota State, University of Wisconsin, Michigan State, Rodale, and us. Uh, so we're looking at it in a bunch of different regions, and we've applied for some grant funding, so it all depends on that, but we're doing it. We're not waiting on the grant money, we're doing it. We did receive $50,000 gift from Organic Valley to help fund this. Uh, so, yeah, I'm real excited about that. Yeah. Um, I just got the evaluation. One of the questions is how you might change. I'm curious as to you know how you use the organic information that you've got as far as eating. Oops. Well, I didn't pack a lunch today, <laughs> um, but at home, I mean, it, it's. Yeah, well, we had a real good food co-op, the Bluff Country Co-op in Winona, or uh, People's Food Co-op in La Crosse, and. You know, I'll go to the grocery store to get plastic bags, or you know, <laughs> it's not a place where I would go to buy food. But uh, <laughs> plus, you grow quite a bit. Here. Yeah, we do grow a lot, so we eat our own potatoes and onions and carrots and can a lot and freeze and you know have fruit trees and stuff too. But yeah, I don't have any livestock right now. But yeah, I I don't know. Um, raised two daughters. They're 26 and 22, and they both were very healthy all the way through, so luck or whatever, but you know, I, I think it does make a difference. What do you 
used for sprays for like vegetable gardening and fruit trees? Oh boy. <laughs> Where did I get information on that? Yeah, that, okay. Well, it all depends on the specific, you know, uh, the specific pest and the, you know, what the problem is. I, I really don't spray anything these days, but uh, the Colorado potato beetle, we hand pick those larvae and rotate them, move them around. And I also found that sunflower is an alternative host or alternate host for the Colorado potato beetle. And we used to always grow decorative sunflowers. And once we got rid of them, we really don't have as much of a problem. But some years they show up. And if you can catch the adults and stop the eggs, you can really help it. You know, and like, the uh, cabbage loopers the, uh, on broccoli and, and those kind of things. The natural BT, the Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, Dipel is one brand that is specific to Lepidopterans, to moths and butterfly larvae. Um, and that's what they are. And so that is effective, but you can also pick them off, or when you cook broccoli, you just pick them out of the pan. I mean, I mean, they, you know what they ate? They ate broccoli. <laughs> I mean, it's not like they're gonna kill you. <laughs> but I, I've got, uh, you know, some disease resistant fruit trees that just I put a lot of compost. I think just building the soil is the biggest thing. Building good, healthy soil and then selecting varieties that are resistant to pests and diseases goes a long way. But, well, that might be a variety. I mean, they're a lot more uh, attracted to like a Macintosh or, you know, some of the, some of the, um, I guess I've got a Harrow Red. It's not having problems so far, but... Well, how about seven, uh, using seven? How safe is seven for veggies or... Well, I, I don't know the details on it, but I, I wouldn't use it. I mean, it's... Um, I'm not sure exactly who the manufacturer is. I'd have to do research to be able to document the, uh, uh, you know, toxicity of it. But it, it, it is toxic. It's quite dangerous. You read the warning label and you think, is this really something I want to eat? You had to think, I'm going to eat this. You're putting it out there on your food. Some of it's going to get in your food. You know. But I'm not, I'm not a chemist. I'm not, and I don't study all those pesticides. I really focus on the organic system as much as I can. So, there's certainly people in the university who could answer that question. Why is the university more proactive in educating and teaching people from the foundation how to raise nutritionally dense, healthy food, yeah. which is the major problem of our obesity and health problems in this country? Mm -hmm. It seems like they're yeah. wasting the almighty dollar, they're moving toward GMOs, yeah. they're heavy into the pesticide industry. Mm -hmm. This is not being taught at the university level. Well, not enough. It, it's 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 getting there, and you know, tomorrow on campus all day, and part of it's on that very topic. Finally, one of our uh, extension vegetable specialists, who's been working essentially for the processed vegetable industry, now is seeing that the processors there's such a low margin that they would like to have more nutrient-dense vegetables and be able to advertise that. And guess where they come from? From organic systems. So now he's like a light has gone on and we're meeting and uh, gonna be doing some research where we've got organic land and we're gonna be studying it all the way from the soil to the shelf and nutrient density is the question. When you look at organic production, it's based on how you raise it, not mm -hmm. the quality of food right. coming out the other end. And that's right. what needs to be set as a national standard. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. I don't know that we'll get there, but it was tough enough to regulate the production practices. And if there's any benefits on the consumer side, that's just, you know, chance. It's not. Yeah. 
comes down to nutrition, yeah. get rid of the toxicity, mm -hmm. and biological diversity. Mm -hmm. And we're, that's not being taught at the university level at all, hardly. Mm -hmm. no. I went through the whole system. Uh -huh. No. And, well, no, and, and to be a doctor, you don't have to study nutrition either. But, uh. but there needs to be more emphasis placed on this at the universities. Yeah. Instead of no, I, the almighty dollar, we need to get down to what is creating health problems mm -hmm. and how do we build sustainability into agriculture yep. where we can produce more with less. Well, I agree with you 100%, and that's why I included some of the studies I did. Is but, that because of the funding is coming from the large multinational? I'd rather, yeah, I, it might be. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that would be a factor. <laughs> I work for the university. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, Cargill gave the university ten million dollars for uh, genomics, which is essentially transgenic. Yeah, and then the public matched that. I mean, yes, the dollars speak, but luckily the organic sector is maturing enough where we, Organic Valley gave us fifty thousand dollars. It's not much, but it's amazing what that drives then. And you know, the biotech industry and the chemical industry has known this forever. That a little bit of their money goes a long way in getting the university agenda shaped and shifted and then they get university results, uh, you know, and now the organic industry is playing catch up and, and uh, I think we'll see a lot more um, uh, organic support for the kind of research that's needed. But it needs to get into the curriculum, it needs to get filtered all the way through. You're right, 100%.